Hi, everybody. My name is Lee Boonstra. I'm a developer advocate at Google. And um, normally, I talk a lot about conversational AI. That's my topic. Uh, I'm the developer advocate for dialect flow, speech technologies, and contact centers. And um, today, I'm going to talk about how you can create your own voice AI. Now, what exactly is a voice AI? Well, actually, it's just a piece of software. And um, you can speak to it by, by spoken commands or just, just having a conversation, and it responds with synthesized voice. Um, so you mean the Google Assistant or Alexa or Siri? Yeah, that's also a voice assistant. Um, but that's not the talk for, the, uh, for today. I'm not going to talk about the Google Assistant. I'm going to talk about how can you create your own voice AI. So how can you create or how can you integrate a voice AI in your own web application or, or app? Uh, just some little facts about the Google Assistant so you can understand the differences of building it yourself manually versus using uh, a smart speaker like the Google Assistant. The Google Assistant yeah, that's publicly available. That means that everybody that runs their app, uh, you can run it. Um, you have all these native features, like, for example, I can ask, like, what is the weather in Amsterdam? And it will tell me that. I, I can invoke third-party actions, or it's like, like apps, um, by using the wake words. So by saying, hey, Google, and then it will open the app. Um, it also means for developers that it comes with consumer terms and conditions, and it has special technical requirements, such as you can only keep the microphone open for, for a minute or so, not, not, not even 30 seconds, I think. Um, so these are all reasons why, as a developer, or, or as an enterprise developer, you, you might choose to build your own voice AI. Uh, maybe because you're running in a closed environment, uh, you're an enterprise app, you don't need to be publicly available, or you have your own hardware, uh, it could be that you don't want to invoke it with, hey, Google, you just want to right away st from the start start your app, and you only want to ask your questions to it and not what the weather is in Amsterdam or set uh, alarms. Uh, it also means that you can work with enterprise terms and conditions, so for a company that might, might be more important, and uh, yeah, you can get around these technical requirements because you're creating the application yourself, you're creating the AI yourself. Google Assistant is very popular for brands. Brands, they bring their brand to the Google system and they profit from the whole ecosystem. Uh, but use cases of for building your own AI, that could be, for example, building a uh, self-service kiosk. Uh, that's what you see at the airport or at the train station. I see them now uh, lately also a lot at uh, retailers, like in shops that you can uh, check out or you can ask information about a product. Uh, we can integrate voice AIs, for example, in, uh, in in car navigation systems, maybe you have your own hardware, maybe you want to build an AI on top of uh, Raspberry Pi. When you think about contact centers, robots in a contact center that pick up the phone for you, that is a similar idea as also integrating your own custom AI, um, running an AI on a smartwatch, I think in, on iOS in general, because iOS or Siri doesn't have a third party uh, app system. And uh, the last example, and it is very popular, or I see that now getting more and more popular, that's integrating voice in a website. So you can navigate through a website by spoken voice. So as th this example of the screenshot shows you, like, you could, for example, on a banking page, instead of searching for uh, a transaction, you could just ask, like, how much have I spent on taxis last month? And it would just update the website for you. It's technically a lot different than how the Google Assistant works, because at the Google Assistant you work with simple commands, uh, sim simple utterances. Uh, I could say like, yeah, turn on the lights or turn up the heat, where when you're building your own streaming API, maybe you want to keep the streaming open and you can talk for 15 minutes. So there are all different types of conversations. It's like when I have a conversation with my wife. My wife, when she talks, it's like, oh, I met this person, and then I met that person, oh, and by the way, and, oh, and have I told you X, Y, Z? And then it's even for a human difficult to, in to understand the intent. So you can imagine for a machine that's difficult as well, detecting the intent. What's the real intent or the reason and what we need to answer? Or maybe you want to uh, interrupt or answer in between. So the idea for me was to create like a self-service kiosk. And, and I created this as a prototype. This will be actually a prototype that will be shown at Google I.O. 
And um, what I do here is I, I can press a button and then I can start asking questions about airports uh, where I fetch the information from various airport websites. And uh, I can speak in whatever language I want to. So if I speak in Dutch, it will work and it will uh, talk back in Dutch to me. If I speak in English, it will speak back to me in English. Yeah. So here you can see it. What you on see on the side, you will see like a little transcript once it hears my uh, spoken voice. And then afterwards, it will show me the, show me the results uh, on the display and it will also uh, yeah, read it out for me. So I'll set it to English now. What time is boarding? Feel like the internet is slow. No, it works. And you see that I'm passport and security checks and boarding can take longer than expected. Per airport, these times may also vary. To prevent delays, we ask that you arrive at both the airport and the gate on time, especially during the busy holiday travel seasons. Now, let's try it out with Dutch. I'll set it to uh, Dutch language and ask a question. Hoe laat moet ik vertrekken om door security te gaan? De belangrijkste tips om de beveiliging zo soepel mogelijk te doorlopen zijn maak uw zakken leeg, houd uw paspoort en instapkaart in uw zak of tas, houd vloeistoffen in een doorzichtige zak van 1 liter bij de hand, neem tablets en laptops uit uw handbagage, verwijder jassen, volg de instructies van het beveiligingspersoneel zorgvuldig op. Now, and this, this information comes from a, from a public website that I fetch. I'm going to explain to you how I've built this. Um, when I started building an app like this, I, I did what every great developer does. Yeah, I went to Stack Overflow. And yeah, yeah, you know what? I mean, I did, my question was on Stack Overflow. Actually, many people were asking the same question on Stack Overflow. But the problem here is, is because I was looking for an end-to-end -end solution, like the individual technologies of using Dialogflow or using text-to-speech or using uh, WebRTC. That's not that difficult. It's the combination of, of hooking these uh, things all up together, uh, figuring out what, uh, yeah, how, how to, to build it all in once. But I managed to do so. And uh, for Google, I created like a, like, a white, uh, like a paper on how to do this as a best practice. And I'm sharing my code also on GitHub. I'm sharing my code also on GitHub, so afterwards uh, yeah, you can download it and uh, play around with it or create some, uh, yeah, s some modifications on it. Um, so my architecture started with a web application. I'm using Angular. You can use whatever framework you like. It doesn't really matter as long as you're using the browser microphone. I'm using the browser microphone because eventually I will deploy it somewhere in the cloud. Uh, but the, the hardware of the microphone is, runs from my computer. That's why it runs on a, a browser app. And um, when I start uh, speaking to it, like, I, I immediately uh, had questions in mind, and I was wondering, like, well, how can I make sure that this stream will work across all these browsers, and especially that it also will work on, the, uh, on the iPads, iOS? And um, the, the stream that I get on the front end, which is an audio buffer, needs to go to my back end, and I'm working with Node.js, which is an array buffer. So how can I make sure that the stream stays intact and that it's not breaking? I came across a, a library. It's called Record RTS, RTC, which is a JavaScript uh, uh, library for audio and video. And uh, you can use it for recording. And it works across browsers. And I, I managed, uh, what I liked about this is that you can also set the amount of channels. And I needed that because like, uh, on the back end, I, I need uh, mono audio. So I need to configure the amount of channels. And I could do that with Record RTC without uh, creating converters myself. Um, then I finally have this stream, and I want to bring it to the back end, um, which I already mentioned I'm using Node.js. Uh, for me, it was difficult, like because how can I stream it that way? Uh, that is bidirectional, so it c I can stream on both ways, and it's binary data. Uh, I think you can do this with AJAX as well, but the thing was that because it's bi uh, binary data, uh, Socket IO uh, stream, which is a plugin on top of Socket IO, yeah, that worked really well because then it was just uh, working out of the box. Uh, 
here you see the code for that. So what I'm doing here is I'm using get user media to get the audio stream from the microphone. Uh, what's important here in this example is you see that the sample rate from the browser is 44.1 kilohertz, but I'm bringing it back to 16 kilohertz because I want to keep the, the size of the stream as small as possible so that it streams very quickly to the backend. Yeah. And here you can see also the, the stereo audio recorder where I set it to one channel because it's mono audio that the speech to text uh, pl uh, plugging on the backend uh, requires. Uh, on the bottom, I'm not sure if you can see it really well, but I set a time slice. I set a time slice for four seconds. That is also why it took like a couple of seconds before I started streaming. And I did that because eventually when the data comes in, I want to uh, bring it in smaller chunks so that I can already sm uh, stream smaller chunks to the back end. And um, what, I, what you see here is in the get user media uh, object and you have like a listener on data available. And on data available, I say like, okay, then get the stream and then use the socket uh, socket IO stream to bring it to the backend. And I'm create I'm also setting the file name because eventually on the backend I'm creating like a temporary wave file where I stream it in, so that I can hook that up to my uh, speech to text, and then I remove it. Uh, yeah, that's what you see here. Then I'm using. Uh, speech to text from Google to, to get the spoken text, so the stream, converted to written text. And technically, I could skip this step. I could do this directly in Dialogflow, because Dialogflow can handle text, but it can also handle audio streams. But as you have seen in my example, I'm using translating functions, where I'm translating what I'm saying. I'm actually translating it to a base language, and in my case, that's English. Uh, so I prefer to have the text version first, because the text I can translate. Here you see the code for the speech to text. It's, it's not that difficult. I'm first creating a speech client. And once I have the speech client, then I need to define the request. And here it is important that it should match the settings that you used on the front end. So in my web app, remember where I said that the desired sample rate was 16 kilohertz. I need to make sure that it's here also 16 kilohertz. Otherwise, it wouldn't read the stream really well when it hears other things. Yeah, I set it to linear 16. That is how, the, how it comes in from the browser. I need to set the language code, which in my case was the language picker from the bottom. And uh, yeah, then I pass it to the, to the speech client where I said dot recognize. And I specify the record, uh, the, re uh, the request object together with the audio stream. That gives me a promise. So in the response, I get the text version. Now, um, what I do with this text version is I'm bringing it to dialogue flow. And dialogue flow, that is a tool for, uh, it's a development, it's a, a suite of tools for conversational AIs. So you can build chatbots with dialogue flow, you can build uh, voice bots with dialogue flow, you can even build robots for contact centers, and it's all with dialogue flow. Um, comes with a web UI, but you can also use the SDKs, which is what I'm doing today. And um, then you can build chatbots on it, so then it can actually react on the questions that I'm saying. And the way how that works, it's through intent matching, where in dialogue flow, as you can see here on the screen, this is the console. You can create a couple of intents, and an intent is kind of like a flow. You, you specify it some training phrases. You can see that here. I would say as a best practice, keep like 15 training phrases, and then you're training the intent, you're training the machine learning model on this training phrase, and then, it, and then you can specify the answers in the intent. So what happens then is then basically when I ask like what time is boarding or I would ask like can I bring a lighter in, uh, in my hand luggage, it looks like oh which intent of all these intents that I've created, which one has the closest match? The one with the closest match, that one returns the answer. And that answer could be hard coded, but it could also come from a system through a fulfillment. And you say like well the, da the data comes out of a database for example. In my case, it was even simpler, eh, because I mentioned I am downloading all these FAQs from websites. There's a feature in Dialogflow, which is called Knowledge Bases. Then the only thing that I need to do is specify URLs of the FAQs, and then it just imports all these questions and answers, and I can ask it a li little different way. It understands what I'm asking, and it will return the answer. So here you see the architecture. Eh, you see it from the speech to text. I'm translating it to a base language. Then I take that 
text version and I pass it to Dialogflow, so I get the result, the answer. The answer comes back in English. I need to translate it to the language of choice of the language picker. Here you can see the code for Dialogflow. Again, it's not that difficult. You first create an agent. Uh, that agent, you set the session path, which basically is your project idea of Dialogflow together with some random uh, key number. And um, then you create a request object. And the request object needs to contain the session path because you need to link it to your Dialogflow agent. And uh, yeah, then you can start, it's what you see in the bottom, you can run a uh, detect intent uh, request where you specify the request, which it has the query input with the text that came out of my speech to text and in my case, out of the language uh, translator. Dialogflow can return text to speech, so an audio stream, but in my case, it returns text because I'm translating it. Um, so what, what I did is I'm using Google Cloud text to speech plugin for specifying um, written text and I get like an audio file back or an audio buffer back. Uh, and we're using uh, for this like WaveNet models, so that makes it sound like very human-like. Uh, this is what DeepMind uh, has created. And yes, this is also the voices that you see on the, in the Google Assistant. Those are also WaveNet uh, models. They sound very natural and unique. You can change the pitches, you can change the pace or the pauses. Yeah. The code for that uh, is kind of similar like the previous examples, you first create a text-to-speech client, then you define a request, but this time in the request I define how my voice should sound like. So will I take a gender-neutral voice or a female voice or a male voice? Um, which language am I using and what kind of uh, yeah, audio encoding uh, will I, do I need? So I'm sending it back to the browser so uh, Linear 16 is good enough. Uh, then in the bottom, you see my call. I take the client and I say uh, synthesize speech and pass in the request. Nice. So then we get the audio buffer. We have the answer. Now the only question that we have is how can we make it sure that it auto plays in the browser? Well, for that, I'm using the audio buffer source node uh, within, within the browser. Uh, the way how that works is you create an audio context. I specified, uh, I pass the stream in as an array buffer. I decode the audio data and then I assign it to an output source. And the output source, in my case, those are the speakers of the browser. Uh, I have to do some small quirks here because on iOS it won't start out of playing. So I had to, I uh, see some people nodding, yeah. So I had to uh, resume it first and then start it afterwards. All right, then you think like, wow, now I'm done. Well, actually to bring it live, then there's another little quirk where you need to uh, be aware of and that is that uh, WebRTC that works on HTTPS. So it needs to be secure connection, so that means certificates. Um, I hate to set certificates uh, with CertBot, so what I used here in this case is App Engine Flex, where I just can create a Docker file, and then I write on the command line, uh, app deploy, and it brings my, it wraps it all in a container and brings it to a browser, and then, yeah, I can run it uh, online. In case this went very quick, and I can imagine that was the case, I, am, I created an open source uh, code repository for this, where you can start playing around with it. Uh, feel free to uh, create pull requests. Uh, I'm happy to work together on this code. And also the slides I'm, uh, I'm hosting on Speaker Deck, so if you want to read it later or see my, review my art architecture, yeah, then go ahead. So thank you.